Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you taking your time to, uh, to attend our first and hopefully of many to come uh, user forums. And we thank you for recognizing Aeromedical. We just got started. We got our, uh, we've been over in Europe. We've done a couple hundred cases over in Europe, but we just got our FDA clearance in December and came to the market in January. Uh, we're very proud to say that we've passed our 2,000th case already. Um, so things are, things are going very quick and very rapid and, and uh, having fantastic results, and we're glad that you're here with us tonight. Um, we as a company at Aeromedical are focused on non-invasive um, technology to address nasal breathing disorders. And the Viver is our, is our premier product. We've got the console and the, and the Viver handpiece. Uh, and I'm here to say that it's the first of many products in a, in a long pipeline that we're going to introduce and we're going to continue to roll products out. And we're very excited to have this group here to, to learn about our first product. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator tonight, it's Tom Tammy from Cincinnati. And uh, Tom's in a very unique situation. He's, he's going to be moderating from the standpoint of, of a of fledgling user. He's, he's done two Viver cases now. He's actually coming from uh, being a physician executive position back into reestablishing an ENT practice and wants to take a look at Viver and how it can work in his practice. So I'll introduce Tom, let him do his own introduction, and then uh, we'll hear from the panel. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, you know, I have really only been uh, aware of this product for not that long, in fact, uh, I, f I see Fred a lot. We golf together a lot. We go to trips together, and for one reason or another, he kept saying we have this great product, but he never really would would give me any details until just recently. And uh, you know, I I do come from an interesting background. Many of you I know. Many of you don't know me. I've been in academia for quite some time. I was at UC San Francisco for a while, at the University of Cincinnati, and then I moved over to a large private system in Cincinnati, TriHealth. Uh, and over the last three to four years, I've been the physician executive of our 700 employed physicians, which is a little bit like herding cats for anyone who's been in a position like that. And, and now I've moved back into a clinical practice, a clinical role, and uh, uh, I did have an opportunity to try uh, this technology, and I think it works. And uh, I have, it's only been a couple weeks, and so we'll see how that goes. But, but uh, from all intents and purposes, it seems like it's a, a pretty good technology. So we have a panel here of uh, some people who've had some pretty good experience, uh, varied experience in terms of where they're coming from, uh, how they look at this technology, uh, how they're dealing with their patients. And I think that uh, as we get further into this program, uh, you'll find uh, that it's not just a, a, a sort of a blowing in the wind sort of technology. I think it's going to be here, here for quite some time. We were going to have a little intro here by Dr. Jakobowitz from uh, Mount Sinai, and I think he was at another meeting and will be showing up shortly. And so he's got a little video and some slides. Uh, and while we're waiting for him, what I'd like to do is go through our distinguished panel here and uh, have uh, them uh, tell us a little bit about themselves, uh, where they're from, what sort of practice they have, and what drew them to this technology, and just in a nutshell, uh, how they find it uh, fitting into their practice or uh, whatever they want to say. So we'll start with uh, Dale. Okay, um, so my name's Dale Amer. I come from uh, just outside of Dallas, Texas. I'm in a five-person uh, private practice group in one of the northern suburbs just outside of Dallas in Frisco. Um, I came into using the Viver, I guess, about two years ago in their initial uh, pilot study and enrolled quite a few patients into it. We um, had great success, and then when it came for commercial um, rollout in December and then I guess into January, we really implemented a lot of it into our, uh, into our patient care and our patient flow. So it's been a real great thing for us. We've seen some real great outcomes. Hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of that tonight, but um, yeah, it's, it's been great. I'm glad to be here. My name is Vasu Karkalipudi. I'm in the uh, uh, suburb of Louisville, Kentucky in the southern Indiana side. We're part of a 17-person um, private practice group. And I be first became exposed to Viver about uh, the beginning of this year, um, searching for a solution for my nasal obstruction patients in the Ohio Valley is notorious for nasal obstruction. And um, so we uh, came across this technology through one of our, our reps that was used to be a balloon rep. And I 
used a couple of my partners as guinea pigs, and our, uh, uh, and they had great results. And so I've been I've been hooked ever since. It's a great product. It's truly been the most uh, revolutionary product for nasal obstruction that I've seen in, in 15 years of private practice. Hi, I'm Amber Luong. I'm in academic practice at Houston, and uh, obviously a multi-specialty uh, practice. I'm a rhinologist, and I've been involved with uh, the device, I think, when we were just putting it together, and, and it was sort of an idea, so I had an, an opportunity of getting to play with it when they were developing it and thinking about the various different <coughs> clinical trials and having some input on that. So I uh, had the opportunity to be one of the first uh, users as well as uh, had some quite a bit of experience with it so far. My name is Michael Sillers. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, like Tom, spent the, the first half of my career in academic medicine and started a private practice in 2005. And so that's where I've been. I have a, another partner. And between the two of us, we've done probably close to 30 of these procedures. Uh, I'll admit that probably the first few I did weren't as good as the last few I've done. So we'll share some of those pearls, I think, tonight about uh, what really makes this procedure successful. Uh, my attraction to it was really two things. One was an unmet need. Uh, like most of you, when I examined a patient with a nasal speculum, I completely missed the nasal valve or with a scope. And so it was an area that I just completely ignored because it didn't have a good, simple solution for it. The other thing was I've known Fred for a long time and Prasad. I mean, I've had a relationship with these guys uh, through the years and through my experience with, with rhinology, and they've had some really good products. And so when I knew they were working on something, I just kind of kept a close eye on it. And as soon as they had a launch, we started using it in our practice. Okay, I made it. Uh, Ofer Jakobowitz, uh, I'm from uh, ENT Analogy Associates in New York. and. Uh, Basically, I got turned on to it through a, a clinical trials division, and uh, and I became very interested in it because of the uh, the concept of truly minim minimally invasive uh, treatment that that didn't require any any incisions for a uh, uh, for a common problem, an under recognized problem, and uh, and I think it fits well within our you know armamentarium of various things we can do uh, now in the office setting for for our patients. Over. Perfect timing. Why don't you come on up? Uh, I think uh, what we're going to do is uh, you're going to give us a little update, I think, on some of the most recent data. It's got a little video of how I do it. And uh, thanks for your attention again. So uh, I guess this is a video. So it doesn't show you that much, but what I want you to just uh, pay attention to the fact is that the patient is actually very comfortable. The patient feels no pain. And, and really all I'm doing is I'm just placing a probe uh, uh, at the target area, and that, and that could be a different target area depending on what you want to do, um, and applying pressure while depressing a foot pedal. And that foot pedal goes on for 18 seconds, and then you just keep the instrument in position for 12 seconds, and that's the, uh, the console. Uh, the, uh, in this particular actually video, I'm actually applying pressure onto uh, actually the, the swell body or the cell, or the, uh, the dorsal septum, actually, in this case, but and because the uh, device is actually not approved, it's not specifically approved for the nasal valve, but it can be used uh, in the nose. So, so we uh, so we can use it on 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 the nasal valve region. Uh, we can use it on swell bodies or and or, or inferior turbinates because uh, there's no um, specific uh, uh, issue there. Um, so this is a um, so the concept of uh, the issue we have with with the uh, looking at at outcome with with nasal surgery for symptomatic nasal obstruction is that despite having some objective testing, the objective tests do not correlate well with with um, with uh, subjective symptoms. They don't have a very good correlation, and for that reason, whether you're looking at the outcomes of this trial or if you're looking at you know, uh, Dr. Reza work looking at the outcomes of reconstructive surgery, or if you're looking at other nasal valve treatments like the Lotera, um, uh, the principal outcome measure that's uh, used for quality of life or the patient's improvement is, is the, uh, the nose scale. And so here, this is what we used for, for, a, uh, for, uh, for this uh, trial, which was a, a, a multi-center trial uh, performed uh, <clears throat> performed uh, in centers around the U.S., and we looked at the nose score. 
Okay, there's no laser, no problem. We looked at the uh, no score at, at baseline, which was actually quite high. It was 80 at baseline, and that's actually very severe uh, nasal obstruction. And then we uh, treated the patients and and tested and and checked and, and queried the no score again at uh, at four weeks, at 12 weeks, and then at 26 weeks. So it was a six-month trial. Uh, and looking at, looking at the data, actually, we saw uh, the response uh, at one month. At one month, we achieved a, a very uh, significant response uh, with some improvement, long, perhaps uh, uh, longer, longer term, but the, the results basically do happen at, at one month. And so the no-score reduction was 69%, which actually is very comparable to the results of, uh, of, the, of the decline in no-score with, with major nasal surgery. And the responder rate, as defined by a, a decrease of 15 points in the nose score, uh, was, was 94%. Uh, we also, uh, there were no serious or major uh, either device or procedure related uh, uh, issues. And the patient satisfaction with the, the outcome, uh, as queried by, uh, by a questionnaire with a Likert, Likert scale, was 88%. Um, so this was, a, this was a trial of about, uh, obviously, 50 patients. It was not, uh, was not controlled, but, but, uh, but this, these were the results which we achieved, which were very comp comparable to, to other and more invasive. Uh, this, is a, this is a brand new data that uh, we just compiled, uh, now extending the follow-up period from six months to, to a year, because that's the question everyone asks, right? Are these results durable? So, um, so again, querying the patients, first of all, in terms of... Uh, the no score, 94% uh, uh, have sustained the improved sleep quality uh, and the ability to breathe uh, during exercise or exertion. You can see the, uh, the pardon me, you can see that the uh, no score, uh, uh, the overall no score is, has been sustained over a year. And, uh, and then we also uh, gave the patients, uh, this, this was done either in person or through telephone interviews, a, um, a quality of life uh, survey questionnaire with various questions. and. Curiously, they reported additional, uh, additional benefits such as less sore throats and less, less uh, sinus infections or using less nasal sprays or taking less medicines, of course, for their, for their nose. Uh, 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 the, the end here was uh, 37 because not, not all patients uh, were, uh, were, were available or, or wished to, uh, to, be, uh, to, 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 be, to be queried. Finally, there's also uh, some data that that, that goes further, goes to uh, a follow-up of uh, 20 plus months. And this is data that uh, we just uh, 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 derived from a very initial pilot testing uh, in Europe. And so it appears that based on this very limited number of patients that the result is durable in the longer term. The goal, of the, the goal is obviously, once we have the, since we have the 12-month data, is to continue and, and there's gonna be a 24-month 24 24 uh, follow-up as well. And, and beyond to look at the durability of the, uh, the symptomatic response of the patients. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Pretty good uh, looking data, actually. Uh, before I get started with uh, querying our panel, I want you to know that there's a couple of microphones out in the audience, and so we are interested in uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, we ask that you ask your question with the microphone, identify yourself and uh, your, uh, where you're from, and uh, ask the question. And we have five eager panelists who want to answer your questions. Let me just start out by saying that when Fred first told me about uh, this, this uh, system he had for nasal valve treatment, my first response was, well, you know, there aren't that many patients out there with purely nasal valve problems. Uh, I think you're looking at a very small group of patients who can benefit from this. And uh, I kept over and over feeling that that was true. But what I'm hearing is that if you can just get a few of your partners in the office to notice some improvement, well, there must be a lot more patients who have uh, an indication for this than simply someone with an obvious nasal valve collapse or a positive caudal sign. So maybe we could start uh, uh, with Dale and uh, talk a little bit about your indications and uh, how you really determine whether someone's a candidate for this or not. Sure, so uh, I think Dr. Sillers touched on it as well. I think, you know, for, for me it had been looking right past the nasal valve. Um, you know, we didn't really have a way to treat it. I don't do uh, cosmetic surgery. I don't do open rhinoplasty or anything like that. So for me it was kind of looking past it and when we first started looking at some of these things, we started 
uh, asking our patients to fill out no scores in the pre-op or while they're waiting, I'm sorry, not pre-op, while they're waiting to see me, we started seeing these numbers really high consistently. And uh, a lot of our allergy patients and, and it became something we started looking at and said, hey, maybe we have this as an opportunity. And we were part of the, the pivotal study, um, that data that you see, we, we put a lot of patients into that study as well in our office and it was, I mean, the results were fantastic. So for us, it was a matter of, or for us, I say my practice, a couple of my partners have, have uh, adopted it as well, um, is identifying the patients that, that you don't think are out there, but really, really are. And you start asking them questions and the impact of their quality of life is substantial. I mean, these are people who are having difficulty breathing, exercising, just normal day-to-day -day living. They've just sort of grown accustomed to it and they've tried everything else, it's failed. And now we have this really in minimally invasive thing. It takes 10 minutes, 12 minutes to do in the office. And they can do it while they're sitting there and, and, they, and the outcomes are great. I mean, the data we've talked about at a month is great, but these people, the majority of them get out of the chair breathing better. So it's an immediate feedback for the patients. They feel great and then um, we've adopted it. I mean, it's been, it's been wonderful. Vizu, do you agree with that or do you have any other? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I started, uh, once I saw how good it worked on several of my partners, I started asking my patients if they had difficulty breathing at night uh, or during exercise. And um, it was amazing for those patients that actually had problems during that time period I simply put a small cerumen spoon and just had, you know, literally one millimeter anterior lateral displacement uh, in the nasal valve to see if they had improvement. And the, and the folks that had an aha moment, they were like, oh my gosh, doc, I can breathe. Uh, those are the ones I uh, initially did the Vivera on and uh, the results, like Dale mentioned, are immediate for a, a, the majority of patients. And um, it, it's, it's really, uh, it's really, change the way that I look at nasal obstruction. That's the first thing I look at. Like Dale mentioned, we didn't really have any whole lot of good solutions for this. I, I had done other things like, you know, Latera and, and MyTech bone anchors and, and breathe right strips. And, you know, I always operate by the KISS principle. Uh, I'm a generalist. I'm not nearly as smart as most of you in the room. And um, I kind of just do things that are simple and make sense to me. And this just made sense to me. And it's, it's worked great. And my, I've done 35 to 40 of these now, and my numbers are very consistent with the data. About 90, 95 percent of patients are improved, and the others aren't necessarily uh, worse. They just didn't have, they didn't, I, I didn't meet their expectations, but that probably some of that is my fault. Amber, you're at an academic center, and as most academicians, you always sort of want very clear-cut indications. Uh, how do you decide if a patient's a good candidate for, for this? Yeah, so at least for me, um, I'm generally pretty conservative when it comes to adopting new technology because I want, you know, it's one thing to see the data, but I want to be able to have the experience and, um, uh, and, you know, and just see how it goes, I guess, first. Um, so I started with the nasal valve, and I think when I started thinking about it, I usually just do sinus surgery or endoscopic, you know, for tumors or so forth. But um, as Dale and, um, and, and, and what had mentioned was that, you know, we really didn't start thinking about the nasal valve. And I think it was really the Latera device that made me start thinking about it and doing it in the OR. But the fact was that I didn't ever feel comfortable doing it in the, op in the office. And so when this technology was introduced and thinking about being able to offer something in the office, it seemed very attractive. And of course, being a non, you know, I'm not a generalist, so I don't do a lot of other procedures other than endoscopic, endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, you know, the Latera was not as attractive to me uh, and I wasn't as comfortable with it. So this one was just a lot easier to utilize. But again, I started out with the nasal valve and that's worked out really well for me. Um, my, probably my, my indications are a lot more narrow than some of these, um, uh, some of the other experiences at the table. Um, it's usually the older gentlemen um, and maybe women who have a lot more obvious external collapse, uh, thick envelopes. Um, those are kind of the really obvious indications. And those patients that I've had, and I've done about 10, um, have done really well on those. The ones where I've varied a little bit have been a little bit not as uh, successful in my hands uh, where uh, I've gotten some of the results that I would like to get. Thanks, Amber. Mike, same question to you. you having come from academia, now you've got a busy uh, private rhinology practice primarily. Uh, what about indications in your, in your practice? 
I think you, you need to think that this is not a device or a procedure looking for an indication because it almost sounds like, hey, we got this wand, let's, let's fix every nasal valve. It really is, it's a paradigm shift in terms of how you think of nasal obstruction. Because when you look at the nose and you see a deviated septum, or, or even before that when the patient says, I can't breathe through my nose, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? It's deviated septum and maybe turbinate hypertrophy. I mean, that's, and that's exactly what you go to. And the patient may even come with a CT that shows a deviated septum and a conchablosa, and your immediate thought is, I'm going to fix that. If you do a caudal maneuver on some of those patients, you'll be amazed at how many of those patients can breathe better with a little lateral displacement of the nasal valve. And it may be that that's really what they need to fix their chief complaint, which is nasal obstruction. So I, I, I'm not used to thinking like that. And because, I, as I said earlier, I didn't have a way to address that or there wasn't a good, easy solution. I'm not a rhinoplastic surgeon. I don't plan to become one. Uh, and it's a big deal for me to send a patient to uh, Danny Russo, who maybe some of you know, great rhinoplastic surgeon, but it's kind of a rigmarole to do that. And it's a big deal to have an open rhinoplasty and some spreadographs placed. Uh, so this really does meet an unmet need, but for me, I've got to think differently about when the patient comes in with a chief complaint of nasal obstruction and not immediately look towards the septum because that's what I've been doing for 25 years. Well, for your, your data was very good, and I think that to put a little twist, could you talk about your indications on, uh, for the 35 to 37 patients in your study? How did you select them? What were your selection criteria for those patients? Because that's good data. Yeah. The selection criteria basically are, are pretty straightforward. The patient uh, could not have a majorly deviated nasal septum. They have to have some benefit either at home from using uh, external or, inter or internal nasal dilators um, or uh, on the clinical exam uh, responding well to a modified uh, caudal maneuver. And uh, the choice was left up to the investigator to make that determination whether to, to the degree that the nasal valve was contributing to the patient's uh, nasal obstruction. Um, and, uh, and obviously they can, could not have un, uncontrolled allergies and, and uh, nasal ptosis and things that would, would clearly compromise uh, the nasal airway uh, in other ways that uh, would not uh, be relieved by, by such a treatment. So uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, those, were, those were a simple, these were very, very simple uh, indications and, um, and, and it's a very open set of patients. I think the trick or the key in the long term for us is to figure out who's really the best candidate. And obviously that's gonna take more time, but, but we're very encouraged obviously by, by the, you know, the uh, preliminary evidence as well as the, the cur our clinical experiences in terms of the response rate, of the, the subjective response rate of the patients. Great, so I think we've seen a pretty consistent uh, way of approaching these patients and not, as Mike said, not just a, a technology looking for a, uh, uh, a disease. We've got a question out here. We have a mic. Hi, this is Dennis Bojreb, and if you know me, I'm a neurotologist. So I have the kiss no idea, and that's keep it simple, neurotologist. <laughs> I don't know why I'm here, except for I'm always interested in nasal things. <laughs> and I call it presbynasalis, you know, because I'm in that age group now. And I see only ear patients, but all of us do a thorough examination, and we talk to our patients, and we know that it's a real problem. The only thing I can understand, and I'm interested in it, in it as an otologist, I don't see how it helps decrease sinus infections. Breathing makes all the sense in the world. Other, you know, nighttime snoring, which I do that too, makes a great story. How does it decrease sinus infections? Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know that it has any <laughs> effect to that degree. Well, like one it, of your slides that's just, said that. That's just what the patients, uh, what the patients reported. So it's not reviewing the number of sinus no, infections, no, it's just, just a patient either with survey. sinus x-rays, no, no antibiotic no, no, treatment no, no. course over six months yeah. before or six months after. No, no, no. It's, it's just, just subjective. Yeah, this okay. is just the patient's perception. I would just say that just it's patient's perception of improved quality of life uh, right, right, right. as in the way that they describe it. But I'm very it. interested, and I think yeah. it's a, a great idea. Thank you. 
You know, it's an interesting question because the per patient's perception of a sinus infection is different than our perception of a sinus infection. And we've all seen patients come in who said, I've been getting sinus infections chronically for the last year, and they haven't had any infections. They've just had nasal obstruction. The fact that it's a subjective uh, patient-reported symptom, I think just uh, that's all it is. I don't think that there's anything objective about that at all. There was another question here I saw. Yeah. Please. Yes, I'm Merle Great from Tallahassee, Florida. A uh, couple things. One, uh, what do you do with the severely deviated caudal septum that's actually impacting the, the, um, the valve area? Do you correct that first? or? That, that's an interesting question uh, as to which step you take first. And sometimes it becomes an, a payment issue uh, as to whether you're going to do something in the office, which may be an, an out-of-pocket payment, or whether you're going to do something in the operating room. And it is hard to know sometimes whether the valve, uh, and the, I would say sometimes the anteriorly deviated caudal septum is, is, a, is impacting the valve. It's part of the valve. And which part are you going to address first? And so if you displace the, the nasal valve laterally and the patient gets symptomatic relief from that, then I might do that first. If they get minimal relief from that, then I might take and repair the caudal uh, deviated septum first. So I think that's part of the evaluation process where you've got to determine which, what's causing the, the most significant degree of nasal obstruction. I think the point of, of this device is, again, treating that area that you maybe previously overlooked and, and not uh, discounting the fact that the nasal valve procedure may be the thing that gives the patient the most benefit, and it's very simple. But but Maybe if it distorts the ala of the nose so much, then you work on the septum first. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. My bias and, is... And then somebody said they didn't know that they, there was a lot of this to do. What are we going to do when they, all these college teams and the NFL comes to us and wants to stop using their breathe right strips? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, yeah. I was just saying, I, I think that, I was just going to add, I think the caudal, yes. I, I think if it's a severe caudal septum issue, that's the more rigid structure, so it makes sense that that is the more, uh, the more uh, definitive uh, target, uh, but uh, so personally I would address that first. Uh, uh. Question back here? Yeah. yeah, it's Mark Abrams, Charlotte. Um, good topic. Uh, I think this is sort of the, the holy grail for snoring this in the base of tongue and we're always looking for a better solution for it and this is fascinating a couple of things um i guess i understand it correctly that it causes a increased concavity of whatever structure you're applying this to is that correct effectively i mean that, that's yes. what i would describe Visually, yeah. that's what we yeah. so i guess the question is um i i noticed you using it in the dorsal septal area is that on the concave surface that you're trying to do that on or to try to make it bring it back to the midline? And I guess the second question to follow up is uh, how much pain do these folks have afterwards? So the, uh, the dorsal septal issue are, are the swell bodies that, uh, that many of us see that sort of turbinate type tissue up on the, on the dorsal septum. And I think that is what most people are, are dealing with when they deal with the dorsal septum to try to, to reduce the size of that. Um, from my experience with, with two patients, uh, there was essentially no pain when I did it. And uh, uh, two weeks after, uh, the one patient said that she had a little bit of swelling and a little bit of discomfort and some crusting, and uh, that was about it. So there was really very little. Probably the injections in the office were more painful mm -hmm. than uh, the post-operative. No, yeah. Actually, actually, the injections, uh, at least in my experience, never the procedure pain, it's, 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 it's really truth is, in my experience, it's non-existent. Um, if I leave the cotton ball soaked in the topical anesthetic in the nose for 10 minutes, and it's not even a cotton ball. It's a small piece of cotton that I just apply to the treatment area so they can actually breathe while it's in. Um, I wait until, they, until the, their incisors are numb, and at that point, they really do not feel the injection or rarely, minimally. Uh, so, so it's been a very, very easy uh, to perform. And during the procedure, uh, um, it's infrequent that they feel anything, at least in, in my series. So um, I've, I guess I must have a little bit of a, a learning curve. Um, so initially, I do have a couple of patients who did have some discomfort. Um, it wasn't really during the procedure. It was afterwards, because mm -hmm. there's some crusting. 
Um, there's one, one patient I think of, and you know, I've done 10, so one person that uh, I did where um, they had a lot more crusting than my other patients, and they crusted for about two weeks. Uh, they were using mupirocin ointment as I had instructed, but um, it just crusted over. In retrospect, and I'm thinking about this, I think that there might have something to do with the injection. We haven't talked about that, but there is some um, better if you put a injection just underneath the, the mucosal skin and then have a fluid uh, barrier between that and the, the treatment. So that way, um, I find that that seems to lead to less crusting and less pain. But yeah, so I suspect that it's not that I didn't inject appropriately to numb him because he didn't complain about that, but that maybe I didn't have a little pocket of fluid and that's why he then ended up crusting. So there was some discomfort in that situation. Yeah, I'll add that when I, I, I switched over to a tuberculin syringe and that allows for that more of that submucosal um, bleb that decreases the pain. And then in terms of pain, I, I really haven't had a lot of pain, but patients do feel some heat sometimes, uh, especially <coughs> with the superior distraction uh, not so much with the, 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 the middle or the, there's, there's three applications. You start off with the middle, and then you go superiorly, and then you go laterally. For some reason, the superior distraction, sometimes people feel like they've got a little bit of heat. Again, it's only 60 degrees Celsius, so it's not at the uh, boiling temperature, but some patients do feel a little bit of uh, heat sensation. But I haven't had a whole lot of pain issues. Dale, any comments about, uh, I mean, we might talk about anesthetic technique here if you, if you sure. would like. So yeah, like, like was mentioned, I, I put a small piece of cotton up in the valve with a little 4% tetracaine and let it sit about 10 minutes. I'll usually, if I'm doing this while in the midst of patient flow, I'll go see another patient while that's sitting there and then come back with a tuberculin syringe, just like Vasu mentioned, and, and then do a little small little bleb and then three treatments on each, uh, each upper lateral cartilage. I mean, it's the patient's in the chair, 12, 15 minutes, you know, depend, I mean, I guess it could be that short if, if I make them wait a little bit longer because I'm, you know, with the patient flow, I'll do it that way. But I haven't had anybody complain of pain afterwards. Um, crusting, I think, has been very, very minimal. Um, I think maybe in the initial phases, the first few patients I did, I had a couple, little bit of crusting, but I haven't had any in the last probably 40 or 45 I've done. Yeah, one um, I, I've done, hang on. I, I've done a handful. I, for size, says I've done more than 20, but I, I I'm sorry. I, I was thinking I'd done like a dozen, but for size, says I've done more than 20. Um, and um, the, uh, I, I think you're going to see probably about two or three out of that number that wound up taking any pain medicine much, um, more than a day or so. And, um, and I, in terms of uh, pain during the thing, I, I, for the local ones, I wind up going um, underneath the, the lip after some benzocaine and doing a sort of field block, uh, like a sort of a, a minor V2 block, and that seems to work pretty well. And then come in and do the mucosal blocks inside the nose um, and along the edge. Um, where are you? Where, where are you <coughs> do you practice? I'm in Atlanta. Atlanta. No, but I, it's it's worked out pretty well for. I, I've only had one that I had to go back and touch up so far, and and I I do the septal swells in the front part of the turbs and and all of that as well. So it's been a pretty positive experience all the way around. Good. Are uh, are you do you, do most of you feel like you're affecting the upper lateral cartilage or the lower lateral cartilage or the inner cartilage? So where do you think you get the effect when you do this lateral nasal wall? I think it's the caudal edge of the upper lateral cartilage in my experience. Dale, you agree, I agree. with that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the place we're targeting. We're, I'm targeting the, the very caudal edge of the upper lateral. Absolutely. Great. I have one question. Right here. Hi, I'm Dr. Kunkus. Um, I'm from here. You're in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a room upstairs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my middle name is Omni. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a couple of things. First of all, crusting is an opportunity. There's no global on, uh, cru on nasal valves. And we bring all our nasal valves back in one, one week to uh, debride them. And it's a charge. Same thing with the turbinates, too. So before you get all bent out of shape about crusting, it's an actually a good opportunity to get the follow up on the patient. Second of all, I think you're overthinking. In the past three years, I've done about 50 of these a year cold steel. I'm looking forward to doing my first few cases with this. 
but um, I'm bored and sleep as well. And no matter how much we push the envelope, we're only getting 50% compliance on CPAP. On almost every CPAP patient, I've been doing nasal valve and turbinates. Where, you know, whether they have positive caudal or not, and I've been able to increase my CPAP compliance about 20% because it really opens up the uh, distal end of the, uh, caudal end of the nose, and they're able to breathe better, and they, and they love it. As far as pain, Motrin, period. We, we inject. I don't wait 10 minutes. I actually wait two and a half minutes because I have a busy practice. We hit them with Xanax. We come in. We make a cut. We snip. We sew. They're gone in 10 minutes. And they come back a week later for a debridement, and then they come back two weeks later for their second debridement, which is allowed under global. And we get a great compliance. So I think you're missing the boat on patients. Before you get your da Vinci's out and start ripping out tongues, I think you ought to think about getting CPAP compliance up by getting the nasal valves going. And we never do a nasal valve, by the way, without the turbinates because it's a triangle. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to doing the VAIR because it will give me an opportunity to the nasal swells as well. But you're doing a triangle, and as you know, you, you, if you, if you inter intersect two ends of a tripod, you're actually interrupting, you know, the uh, balancer, and you're going to open it up. So, anyway, I advise you all to get to know a nice sleep doctor, <laughs> and um, get into their noses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, the one right over my here. My name is uh, Isaac Braverman from Israel. I'm working in the. Um, medical center and the Technion Faculty of Medicine, and I had the opportunity to work with Ofer Kubovic a few weeks in Manhattan, and I was very amazing from the air in, and like the procedures for the patient because it make them better for sleep medicine and for rhinology. Uh, I see great potential for the nasal valve and for, for the swell body, and we just want to take one. A device for Israel already. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Um, my name is Jonathan Foreman. I'm from Tampa, Florida. And um, I've done, I think, six of these at this point. And um, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I actually, I, I've, of the six that I've done, five of them have been thrilled, like life changing, they've said. And then one says, she feels better. That was my second one that I did, but she doesn't feel like it's like changed her life, and I'd like to have a second shot at, at her with it, which I think I'll get. I think, um, you know, it was part of that learning curve, and I think I just really kind of missed that crotch really up on the septum, the, that crotch that's sort of from the upper lateral cartilage that comes down. So I just want to sort of ask you a quick question, if any of you have noticed that may be one of the failure uh, sites. And then the other question I had for you is that I have been staying away, offering it to my patients that have nasal valve collapse and have been pretty much strictly um, offering it to my patients that have more of a stenotic nasal valve um, and rather than a dynamic collapse. I just wanted some comments from, from you guys on, on that. So um, as I mentioned, it, my, my usually go-to patient is where I see an actual dynamic collapse, and they've worked really nicely on those patients. So, um, and then in, in terms of the repeat patient, I had one patient who had a very thick envelope, had a dynamic collapse, and was complaining of nasal congestion. And so I treated him with the, um, with the Viver, and then he said he improved like 60, 70 percent. He was very happy with it, but uh, he wanted to have some better improvement, and he wanted to have it repeated again. It had been about three months since the initial treatment, and so at that point I said, okay, I can give it a shot, and so we did it, and he was thrilled, which I was really surprised because he was already so happy after the first one. It wasn't a failure, so I really didn't expect much to be honest, but he was just so, you know, he was like, I want to try it. And so he came back and he was really very happy with the, the second treatment. Now, it's only been a month, so, um, but I guess based on the data, the results should be sustained, but he's, he was happy with it. So the repeat treatment hasn't been an issue. Dr. Jacobowitz, in your study the, uh, of the 37 patients, would you say that uh, there was an equal split between dynamic and static uh, nasal valve obstruction, or do you think, w what do you think in terms of those patients that you reported on? I think, I think the, they're mostly a dynamic obstruction, actually. And it's not my study. It's everybody's study. 
So the study you reported on. Okay. Please, <laughs> which is submitted for uh, submitted for publication at this point, <laughs> by the way. Um, so um, I just took the credit. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, it's, mo it's mostly dynamic, but I, thi I think these are issues that we just don't have answers for right now. And obviously the, the tissue properties are going to differ. The thickness of the cartilage, the overlying skin, the structural stability is going to vary from patient to patient. And, and it's not something that we uh, quantify. So, so I, I don't think it's that simple to say, okay, is he, very he or she very collapsible or not? Uh, the question is why are they collapsible? And whether it's the tissue properties of the valve itself, maybe it's the, the angulation of the septum, the, uh, there could be many reasons, that, many factors that modify that. So, um, but at least in, in our study, uh, most patients, the majority had uh, dynamic collapse um, uh, bilaterally. Yeah. I've actually, uh, initially I just used only th just three sites, but some patients require more than three sites. So the device gives you that flexibility to do more than three sites. So if somebody has a particularly long, long segment of um, static collapse, uh, don't, don't, don't feel shy about going to more than three sites. And I've done a handful of patients, four to five sites per side, and they've done well. They haven't had any uh, yeah. excessive crusting or any other complications. We've got yeah. a question oh. back here. Oops. Yeah, let me, let me just comment real quick. So the question about the CPAP tolerance is actually really great. I've, I've actually had kind of fell into that, had some patients who were complaining of nasal congestion and nasal problems and were on CPAP. And when they get that treated, their compliance, they said, hey, this really helps a lot. So that was one thing I, I've definitely seen some benefit on. And the other thing with the dynamic versus static, static collapse, I don't really distinguish. I'm just really looking for the patients who have the nasal, you know, nasal valve problems. So it's not one or the other for me. I've treated both. Had a lady who had had multiple rhinoplastic surgeries and was still miserable. Didn't, she's about as static scarred as you can imagine. Treated her and she had like the most glowing, she thinks I walk on water, which is great. I mean, her little testimonial was fantastic. It made a huge difference to her, but I don't distinguish. And uh, I've had real great results. I, I, I mean, that's why I'm up here. I think it's great. <clears throat> Question back here. Uh, yeah, Stephen Davis, Los Angeles. I was just wondering for the responders, what's the longest you've had to wait for them to respond? Most of my patients are happy the minute they walk out of the chair. And I see them back three to four weeks afterward. And again, I've had, uh, I've done about 40 of them and I've had two people who were less than happy. They weren't unhappy. The other 38 have been happy, very happy. So I see my patients back at a week and then at four weeks. And I would say that it's by a week, maybe one or two, I think around 50 is what I've treated, have not had results by a week, but then by four weeks have. So it's the vast majority, like I said, like I said earlier, I mean, they get out of the chair and they're just thinking it's fantastic. I mean, they get immediate results. Is that necessary? It was in the beginning. I don't, I, I, it was this, this, the crusting thing. We don't, I mean, not for debriding, just to see them back. I just want to kind of see how it was, but you know, most of them want to have it evaluated again. They're putting antibiotic ointment on there and we've changed some of that. I don't do that as often anymore. I've seen at six. It's kind of like a tonsillectomy. You don't want to see your tonsillectomy back in a week because they're going to just complain bitterly and they're, they don't like you. So I wait six weeks, and by that time, the crusting is gone. The, at four weeks, in general, they've had a response. They're all going to have a sore nose if they have to try to grab and blow their nose a few days later, maybe last for a week or so. So there is, there is pain associated, not with the procedure itself, but the, the aftermath. So you, you can't do a surgical procedure. You can't put 60 to 70 degrees Celsius inside somebody's nose and it not hurt. So there is some pain with it, but it's Tylenol, Motrin, uh, non type pain. I, I, if I can maybe ask a question, Tom, I want to ask the panel what their anesthetic technique is because I think that's absolutely critical. We've hit on the topical anesthetic, but I'm talking about exactly the injection because the, as I said when during the introduction, the first few or not as good as my last few, and it had to do with the anesthesia. Um, I wasn't using enough injection. I was afraid to balloon that little site uh, because I thought, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to see the scroll. I'm going to put the device in the wrong place. And so what I've learned is to use at least a CC on each side to not worry about the, the ballooning effect and waiting 10 minutes. Surgeons are impatient. I'm one. I'm impatient. If you put it, if you're going to take the time to inject, let it work. And so that's, everybody's got a smartphone, so be smart. Mm -hmm. yeah. Set it for about 10 minutes yeah. and wait for it to go off before you go in there. And if you do that, that ballooning is gone. You've got enough fluid in there. 
uh, for the device to work. Uh, it's not going to hurt. Uh, you're going to see your scroll. And since I've started doing that, uh, the, last, the last ones have been much better than the first ones. So I think it's important because we've kind of talked around the anesthesia technique. So I'm just curious as to what everybody else is doing because I think that's, after you've done the patient selection, the procedure is easy. It's a simple procedure, but, but it depends on the anesthesia technique. I think Mike, that's are you seeing uh, less or no crusting now that you're putting more fluid in on that nasal side of the uh, scroll, or is that still a problem? It's still, it's still something that happens because everybody's skin is a little bit thicker or thinner, so everybody's anatomy is different. So I, I don't think the anesthesia technique is going to change that significantly. So just prepare the patients for it. So I guess I'll start. So my, like I said, I take a small piece of a cotton ball and I soak it in four percent tetracaine and I pack it up into the into the valve, kind of up into the little crotch there, and let it sit about ten minutes or so. Then I'll come back and use a tuberculin syringe. I've started using that or a twenty-seven gauge, you know, real small, yeah. and do about a cc. I've kind of been similar to what Mike had found. The less was not more, um, and it was right about a cc. And I let it sit. I'm not patient at all, <laughs> at all. And uh, so I'll wait maybe probably five minutes, and usually I'll try to develop conversation with the patient to kind of pass the time a little bit, and then I'll go to the other side. I think the longer you wait, the better it is. If I can do it during the patient flow, it's probably better, but like I said, I'm, patience is not one of my virtues. So I like to go quick, and then yeah, once the procedure gets started, it's, I mean, it's real fast, but that's, it's a packing of local anesthetic and an injection of 1% lidocaine with 100,000 epinephrine, and that's it. Uh, I do two sites, so I'll do one to kind of blue in the middle portion, and then I, th because of what somebody mentioned earlier, they feel the heat on the, on the most medial treatment, I guess. And, uh, and so I'll kind of art the needle and, and put a little bit more up towards that scroll area because they, they tend to complain about that in the initial phase. They, they complain about that area more than any other spot. So, but, so I guess two spots, I guess maybe three quarters of a cc in, in, the, in the first location, kind of balloon it out. And then I'll kind of go back once it's numb, I treat that and then go back to the same side and treat a little bit more medially. So I use 4% tetracaine pledgets. I put two on each side and just stuff the nasal vestibule. And I wait about 15 to 20 minutes, go and see some other patients, and then come back. And I generally just use one cc. I have one cc of a tuberculin syringe and usually use about 0.4 to 0.5 on each side. Um, and if they feel the tuberculin syringe, then I go and, and wait a good 5 to 10 minutes. If they don't feel the tuberculin syringe, I've found that that's a pretty good litmus test that they're not going to have too much pain with the actual device. Um, so if they don't feel a whole lot of pain, I'm... I don't want the fluid to really dissipate and cause more mucosal injury. So um, I actually just don't wait at all. I just inject one side and then inject the other side and then go back to the first side and go right away, as long as they didn't feel the tuberculin syringe a whole lot. So the only difference is that I, I spray my patients, and it's probably because I scope I do it on, under scope. And that's one thing I know the video showed you did it under a headlight, I guess, because I do everything with a scope. So, <laughs> so we, I spray with 4% lidocaine and uh, Afrin, and then I immediately put 4% uh, uh, lidocaine. So I don't use tetracaine or benzocaine. Um, so I use lidocaine on a, um, on a you know, cotton ball leave it there. I'm usually am pretty patient, um, at least 10 minutes, um, and then I'll come back in and inject. And I'll probably inject closer to one cc, because I have learned that when I didn't put enough and get that nice blub, um, I did have some more issues than without it, with the, without, well, I mean, with the blub. Uh, so, and then I'll inject, but I, I, I'm also, I agree with you in the fact that I didn't want to, I was afraid that it would dissipate. So I guess that's interesting to know, Mike, that it doesn't dissipate after you, you know, leave, walk away for 10 minutes. But since I've already had the topical, I'll usually inject, come back in about five to seven minutes and I, I do the procedure. Some of, some of the waiting has to do with your, your patient flow setup. Right. I mean, because I'll go see another patient. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not chomping at the bit to get in there and do it because I'm going to go see another patient and come back. So I think how you set up your patient flow does make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you have to leave in a couple of minutes, Amber. Uh, you know, what I wanted to ask is uh, how you handle your patient when you initially see them and, and get them interested in a procedure that's in the office and more often than not is a cash procedure for them. So how do you deal with that? 
So um, I'll just tell you from an academic perspective, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I guess that some people would be surprised that in academics, I know I've already gotten approached from some of my panelists here, like, are you guys really doing this in academics? And we are, um, because we do have facial plastics, so we actually have that workflow. And one of the things actually Prasad and, and, and the company has introduced to us is putting out a survey. And so we, um, we reached out to our patient population, gave them a survey to ask them if they, their nose score, and then if they were interested to reach out. So I, I see that Martin Satardi, um, my chair is here, um, how many patients responded? Because I think we sent out 2,000 surveys. Yeah, so we, we sent out 2,000 emails, and we had um, probably about, uh, it generated about 40 appointments total. We did similar, too, in our practice, too. I, I forget the exact numbers, but it generated, I think, about 45 to 50 appointments that we've had, and a lot of follow-up from that. Yeah. We, we had very similar results. So in the survey, you're basically asking them uh, to come up with a, a no score. And uh, as part of the survey, they realize that this is an out-of-pocket procedure if they're interested, or is that something that you deal with when they make their appointment? I think the survey indicated that this would be a cash pay procedure. Mm -hmm. This is all handled before they get to me. So we did th the same kind of email blast through our EHR, but also Facebook ads, and so patients did the no score, if they hit a certain threshold, they called in, they spoke with someone in our office, and that whole discussion took place before they ever walked in the door. Once they walk in the door, they're coming in as a consult to see if they're a candidate for this procedure, and if they are, we'll perform the procedure in that same setting. So uh, it's fairly streamlined. I know there's other ways to do it, but that's, that, and that generated not only some of their uh, candidates and procedures, but also some patients who were not Vivere candidates and who had other issues, and they came in and now they're in our practice. And so it drives patients to your practice either way. They're not all Vivere, but they're all patients, so that's helpful. Amber, I know you have to leave. You've got another meeting to go to. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And Martin, thanks for coming. I think uh, we're just about close to an hour here. I wanted to just close this up with uh, asking the panelists if, since they've been using this technology, if you have changed your approach or your feeling about nasal obstruction or how you approach patients with nasal obstruction uh, compared to what you did two years ago or before you really got acquainted with this. So yeah, I'll start out with that. I, I would say absolutely. I think that, you know, I. I we talked about already. I mean, we look past the nasal valve. Now we can We can find something that actually works very, very well and, and, and hits a, um, a real good sweet spot for a lot of patients that are suffering with a wide variety of problems. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of these things that in, we talked about the email blast going out, but even your established patients. I mean, there's a lot of patients that you stop now to ask them, well, how well do you breathe through your nose? How's the breathing at night? How about when you exercise? You know, we've all seen patients whose septum's a little deviated and, you know, like, how do you breathe? Well, I breathe fine. Okay, well, then you do a little coddle maneuver. Wow, that made a huge difference. Well, that's for the patient, you know, yes, it is a cash pay process, but, but the, um, you know, the, with deductibles the way they are now, people are spending a lot of money for it. We have have really have not had much, um, I guess, resistance to the cash pay model. I mean, the area that I'm at is a pretty affluent suburb of Dallas. I mean, that definitely plays a role in it, but there's no question. We've, we've had patients that have been more than willing to pay for the out-of-pocket up front um, just for the benefit that they get. And, and the immediate feedback is really vital for those people because, they you know, they have a cash, it, they're, they're, they want, they, you know, they feel like they want to get a value out of what they did and, and the immediate feedback is great. So we've, um, but for me, it's just been a, finding, talking to patients or looking at it, looking at patients a little different way, kind of looking a little broader at the nasal valve than I used to and, um, and now allowing us to treat this, you know, thing. And, and we, there's people have touched on turbinates and the swell bodies and, you know, for me, we'll, we'll treat that if it's necessary at the time. There's no question. So. Dr. K. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's been a game changer for me. I, I'm uh, a, a pragmatist, and, and I usually just give patients who have this type of problem a list of their treatment options after I assess them from least invasive to minimally invasive, and I really just let the patients decide and believe in full transparency, and, and this is the cost, and these are the risks and benefits, and uh, if you're honest and genuine uh, about uh, about your options to your patients, I, I find that this is a pretty easy, easy thing for patients to grasp because you're able to emulate what you can do with the Vivera, unlike 
which you can do with a lot of other surgical procedures, you, there's no good way to emulate that. And the patients can decide for themselves if this is a, a value for them. Mike. The answer is yes. It's changed my practice. I mean, the nasal valve is the front door. If the front door is closed, then nothing gets in. So it's, it's an opportunity for us to, again, address patients' quality of life, which is what we're doing all day, every day, for the most part in rhinology is we make people feel better. So it's just another opportunity to help someone feel better. Over. I agree with everything that's been said uh, in the sense that, you know, when we have, when the alternatives are, you know, invasive uh, surgery, then, then we don't uh, look for it as much uh, uh, as opposed to having something that's uh, simple to do in the office setting. So it does make you open your eyes and, and, and look, look at, at certain things you may not have paid uh, as much attention to on a, on a clinical exam in the past. So. Great. Are there any last uh, minute questions from anyone in the audience that you'd like to, any burning issues? I'd like to just thank uh, everybody on the panel. I thought it was an excellent discussion of a new technology. Thank, thank Fred and his team for bringing this technology to us and uh, hope everybody has some plans for dinner tonight. So thank you. <laughs>